If you're having a flagging sex drive, you need cinnamon and carrots. Cinnamon and carrots. Cinnamon and carrots. In a juice way or or just... I'll consult the manual. I think... You could do what up. You could... I I mean, you could just like lick a carrot, dip it in some cinnamon. I don't don't know. Bake Bake it. (laughs) History. I'd like to follow me down the rabbit hole. History. I'd like to break a Hello, and welcome to the Hilf Podcast. History, I'd like to fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody. Now, this episode is a deliciously fun romp through the history of the spice trade with my guest, television's own Wayne Wilderson. His IMDb credits read like a CVS receipt, and you'll find that he is as effortless on a microphone as he is on camera. Now, while you listen, you may hear occasional little pops and clicks. They're not a problem with your audio. They are the lids to the collection of spices I brought for Wayne to taste and smell as we go. And they're loud little fuckers. (laughs) Now, before we get into this spicy episode, a request. Would you please give us a rating and a review wherever you listen? We're a new podcast thrilled by the ever-increasing listenership and eager to get into even more ear holes. So... Pimp us out, will (laughs) you? We're making merch. Maybe there'll be a beer cozy in it for you or something. (laughs) Um, In the meantime, sit back, relax, maybe go grab yourself a cup of mulled wine and enjoy this hilf of the spice trade. Let's get started. I want to tell you a little bit about where we are right now. (laughs) I am in the rec room of my building, uh, which is... A colorful spot. It's a lovely spot. It is. It has confetti wallpaper. Only halfway down, so you know you're in the middle of a celebration. That's right. That's right. So it always kind of looks like New Year's Eve 1986 in here. It really does. And there's a there's a really, really nice treadmill in here. Talk it's, about history. <laughs> it is just beautiful. It's beautiful. It There's like a smear. I can't tell if it's paint chip or a yeah. smear on the handles. Like Think somebody broke a nose. Generous. Yeah. Um, And I am here with my dear friend, Wayne Wilderson. I can say dear friend. You were were at my bridal shower. That's right. We've known each other for years. We lived in the same city twice. I feel like that's dear friends. I think that's dear friends. I think that is definitely dear friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We haven't slept together, to be clear. Not not yet. yet. Not yet. And you did your homework because the only thing I ever asked my guests to do is give me a subject, you know? <laughs> and sometimes I'll give you a nice narrow okay. list. I'll be like, I, how about, you know, here's three really good things that you could choose from. And sometimes that's where we run into trouble. People go, I don't know how to give you an assignment, Don. I got to be honest. I like history. I don't know if I want to fuck it or not. It seems like a lot to ask. And you, Wayne, were like, cinnamon. Let's do it. Cinnamon. And I was like, fucking A, yeah. <laughs> cinnamon. It's not a rock star. It's not like a sexy person yeah, from history. Yeah, you thought maybe it was a stripper, right? Here. And it could be both. Who knows? Now, Wayne, I'm going to give your credits. This is going to take probably the whole hour. Oh, settle in, people. Yes, because I'm not going to give all your credits because, honestly, it would take it would take too long. So I've broken it into decades. Look Ooh, at You can look wow. at my notes if you okay. want. I did call you television's own. Oh, I was adopted some decades ago. They, they television, they take <laughs> some TV. television has you on Wednesday, Friday. And then Hollywood has me on the weekends. <laughs> Hollywood has you on the weekends. <laughs> when did you move out to LA? I moved from, so from Minneapolis, correct? This coming April will be 30 years. So April of 92. You hit it right away. It was, uh, well, actually the first job that I got being from Minnesota, the first job that I got here was for a Target commercial, Target based in Minnesota. And about halfway through the shoot day, I was talking to the agency people and I said, that's so great. I mean, it's my first gig in Hollywood. I'm actually from Minneapolis. And they went, oh, don't, 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 do not say that. I said, why? What's going on? I said, our budget to come out here is to find people from Los Angeles. <laughs> We're supposed to find Los Angeles out. Don't tell anybody on set that you're from Minnesota. <laughs> oh, no. It's like when you do commercials out here where they want real customers right. and not actors. not actors. They want to be able to put under their... <laughs> Little, uh, you're like, yeah, I got, the, yeah, I got. Fucking, I drive a Subaru. <laughs> now I gotta pretend I don't have dreams <laughs> to get to be in your commercial. I gotta pretend I've never aspired to be anything but a fucking right. Subaru owner. No, real people, not actors. <laughs> Here's your '90s credits. Wow. Not all of them. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. Wow. Frasier, Seinfeld, Mad About You, 
Ellen and the blockbuster history making mega smash hit Independence Day. That's right. That's right. Uh, Frasier, interesting story. I was on the first episode after the pilot of Frasier and I got cut. They told me before it aired, thankfully, oh. and said they would have me back. And so I was on the 10th episode. And then I wasn't back again. <laughs> but it was good. It was, was good. Nice. it was nice that it was until you got your agent must have been like, <gasps> we got him. We got him. We got the guy that's going to book the 90s. It came out running. It came out running. It was <laughs> awesome. And it didn't stop there. Because then the early aughts, and through the early aughts, you got West Wing, Malcolm in the Middle, Grey's Anatomy, The Office, ER, and CSI. Right on. And if I'm not mistaken, you were the grapes in the Fruit of the Loom More ad. More specifically, I was the purple grapes. And uh, <laughs> my right. friends, That's my right. other friends, J.P. Manu and uh, Richard Horvitz, were the green grapes. There were two guys yeah. that were green grapes? Were, well, yeah. Uh, J.P. Uh, first and then Richard. Yeah. They got recast. Well, it's a, it's a sordid story. Is there, there's wine in those grapes. <laughs> there's much Merlot. We got to stomp that out. We got to stomp that story out. Before I have the... <laughs> heard them all. <laughs> I don't doubt it. And then, of course, it didn't even stop there because in the, what do we call the tens? tens. This is the I tens, the, the tens. Ten, the tens. Yeah. Uh, two and a half men, mm-hmm. how to get away with murder, Big Bang Theory, the mix. Veep. Right, right. Holy hot shit, man. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. And I feel like every time I turn around, I'm screaming at the TV, it's Wayne! It's Wayne! Well, I like that. that and mission. I looked at your IMDb right now. You mm-hmm. have post production, you have things filming. Bring us up to Speed, Wayne Wilderson. What um, are you working on right I've now? I've done a couple of films that I just finished. One was called Trust. Uh, and uh, the other one is called Diamond in the Rough. Uh, Jeanette Godoy is the director, and um, we're very, you know, uh, female-oriented crew and uh, behind the scenes and very uh, diverse cast. And it was quite a lot of fun. I play the manager of a country club. Hey. Typecasting. Typecasting. <laughs> they were like, oh, we just don't have anybody that really seems... <laughs> I mean, they work here, but do they manage? We need a manager. I got you. <laughs> Journeyman actor. <laughs> <laughs> Hire him. Hire him. You know, I'd even be green grapes. Green grapes, Absolutely. purple grapes, any grapes that you got. <laughs> we might be long in the stem, but who knows? Oh, my. Now, tell me, was that like an underwear exclusive then? Was there like a, a thing where you couldn't do you couldn't do underwear for a decade or well, something? Absolutely. I mean, when you do any commercial, you know, if you do a Lexus commercial, you can't do a Volvo commercial. But, yeah. Yeah. But I, we did that for 12 years. That was a, a really, really great. I mean, that that's the house that underwear bought. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of underwear do you wear now? Um, well, they paid me enough for Calvin Klein. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I'm honored that you have joined us here for nice Hill, here. the history I'd like to fuck. And you assigned me cinnamon. I'm intrigued to know... <laughs> Why? I often get these cravings for something to eat. And you know when you get those cravings, but you don't know what it is. It's something specific. And often it's sort of a cinnamony thing. Or the smell of cinnamon will will bring something else up in my mind. I'll be like, oh, I wanted a falafel. Or, oh, I, I needed uh, eggplant parmesan. That's the thing I was thinking about. And somehow cinnamon, the smell of cinnamon triggered it. That's about as deep as I went. But I thought, there's got to be some great history behind it. And... Detective oh, Brody oh, could, oh, oh, could I, dig deep. So I'm going to just rub cinnamon in your eyes. I'm going right to take nose. an Uber home because I can't see anything. You're not going to be able to see. You're going to be like your stripper cinnamon is going to be so pissed. Oh, you just call her to pick me up. If only. I had a blast researching the history of cinnamon. I'm going to show you my book. I always start with my research so you know that I don't make it up. I I read this book. I'm going to hand it to my friend Wayne. gullible, but it is nice to have evidence. It is. It's called The History of Temptation Spice. By uh, Jack Turner. By Jack Turner. It was a joy to read. I am giving you this book. Oh, thank you very much. It is full of my silly-ass notes. Um, I underline and write silly-ass notes all over it. So some people find that intriguing. Some people find it insufferable to read a book with somebody else's notes in it. Well, this is (laughs) absolutely great. This is Thank you so much. What a great gift. And the the cover is very appetizing. It's got that sort of makes you hungry looking at it. It does. It's orange and amber. It does. It's like, come on in here. Just like the cinnamon itself. And you can imagine there's a lot of sources out there with a lot of great history of the spice trade and spices in general. One of the reasons why I chose this book to go to is because Jack Turner really does the history of these spices. Okay. 
via why we love them so much. Mm. So we've just sort of presumed in a lot of histories. Of course we love spice. And then you had the age of discovery and everybody ate it. But why was it so powerful that it launched the discovery age and mm-hmm. all these things? And he kind of discusses the allure and the and the ancient temptation of it's these spices. It's got to have to do. I'm sure you'll get into it, but like what, the modes of travel and what what was available when and exactly exotic foreign places. Those are all the key words in all of the languages that ever described spice. Those were the key words: exotic, alluring, um, rare. You know, and right. this was part of what made them so expensive, okay. which is a key. Um, so that book was fantastic. Then I watched a couple of documentaries. One in particular with this boring ass girl named Kate Humble. <laughs> My I apologies. Come on, oh, bitch. <laughs> Kate, I should take it back. Kate's a nice lady. Kate, Kate can fuck. Kate fucks. I, I am single. <laughs> Kate, Kate is just this fantastic historian who goes on this worldwide quest to find the history of pepper and all these spices. And she gets to, she was riding elephants and she's hanging cool. out in these like Bangladeshi markets. And this it's a, a recent fascinating time? documentary within the last 10 years. Okay. So in the history of spice, <laughs> very, very recent. But yeah, uh, her documentary is fantastic. I will have links to all of this stuff on our site. After all of that research, after accumulating all of this knowledge, mm-hmm. Wayne, here's my plan for the history fucking that we're going to do together of cinnamon <laughs> and the spice trade. Let's get it on. I'm going to start with the stuff that may be familiar when you're talking about spice and the spice trade, okay. which is the age of discovery, okay. right? Columbus, mm-hmm. Vasco da Gama, Magellan, all these famous explorers that Columbus, headed out. awesome, dude. And so popular right now. <laughs> <laughs> such, so easy. Like, I mean, such an uncomplicated <laughs> historical figure. And, uh, and why these guys were so motivated by spice, how that was really what launched them in the first place. Place. Right. Then we're going to go back to why they in the 1400s were already so convinced that they could make a fortune in spice that okay. they took all these risks and did all of these quote unquote firsts, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to go into some of the fun, crazy, weird applications of spice, specifically cinnamon and the various ways that we have utilized <laughs> and applied. It's not just for eating anymore. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to cover um, the end of the age and why in front of my friend Wayne, I have brought the spices we will be discussing today, all of them Absolutely. from my spice cabinet. Cornucopia. Most of them were from the dollar store. <laughs> well, um, not the, uh, not the, uh, not these. Oh no, that one's organic, that's girl. The, that's the fancy. That's shit. a Whole Foods one. You can uh, tell. You can tell the good stuff. <laughs> and, I uh, got money. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say first of all, some of you may be cinnamon connoisseurs. I don't know why you're here, and you may be already um, consternating over the fact that I am not distinguishing between cinnamon and cassia. Cinnamon and cassia, very, very similar spices. They are totally different plants, though. How do you spell cassia? C-A-S-S-I-A. And it is grown in China and Mm -hmm. among other places. In the ancient times, it was mostly grown in China. It was a little bit easier to get. But for the most part, the people who were buying and consuming and trading this stuff didn't know the difference. So I'm not going to distinguish between them any more than they did. It was a (laughs) knockoff and nobody cared. Yeah. When we talk about the spice trade and the spices of this era, we're talking about pepper, clove, nutmeg, and mace, which actually come from the same plant. They're just harvested at different times. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon, of course. Of course. And ginger. So as we go, if you need a quick, if your nose needs a quick reminding of what these things are, and you, listener, go on to your own spice cabinet. You probably have all of these in your house right now, which is remarkable in and of itself when we start covering all of this crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. This mace, what I'm, you, I'm yeah. smelling the mace now. It's sort of like JV cinnamon. It's like, yeah. uh, someday I'll be a Jedi. <laughs> if I just sit in the sun long enough. I got the spices Excellent. out. I got your book in front of you. You got a beer in your hand. Mm-hmm. And I just want to... I just should take a picture of you because you and oh. your Hello Kitty headphones is <laughs> I, 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 it's wild that I have gotten used to it. <laughs> it I, have, I should mention, in addition to being um, out of my house because of childcare, because I, the, the bottom line was, who gets to be comfortable, me or the baby? And the answer is always the baby. So the baby has the house, and I came down to the rec room, and I realized my headphones were broken. And when I went upstairs to get a fresh pair of headphones, the fact is the only ones in the house that work are my daughter's. Hello Kitty They're headphones, adorable. and they have a little red bow, <laughs> and they are squeezed onto my head. And, I'm and I glad. think I knocked on your door and woke your child, and I apologize. That happens. She should have been awake. That She should get a job, too. So. You're welcome. <laughs> 
Are you ready to fuck this history? Let's do this. Let's fuck it. Now, I have, as I said, on the table in front of us, six spices here that would have paid for you and I to live for our entire lives wow. if we could have gotten a fraction of this in our hands at any point in our lives. H- how expensive was it? It depends on what time period you're talking about. In Rome, mm-hmm. we have some costs of things that, that we can compare. And a pound of cinnamon oil was six years wages for a centurion. Wow. So a centurion is an officer. They, yeah. They're called that because they have about a hundred-ish guys that are underneath them. So one pound of cinnamon oil, six years wages. Wow. Extraordinary. In the Middle Ages, like 1284, one pound of mace was the same cost as three sheep, <laughs> which is, which I, get, I don't I get bedoy. I mean, presently, I would still say great deal. <laughs> great deal. Um, <laughs> you better be getting some mace. Where are you taking those sheep? One pound of nutmeg would uh, buy you a cow. Same cost as a cow. Wow. And basically what this meant was that for the poor and the, and the middle class, spices, if they were lucky enough to have them, were not eaten. Mm-hmm. It was rent. It mm-hmm. was trade. It was mm-hmm. always a currency for them. Only the rich and the affluent and the crazy prestigious could even consider sprinkling it on their eggs. Mm-hmm. Right. But by 1492, when Columbus Sailing sails, that ocean blue. spice equals wealth. It's mm. used in religion, ceremonies. It's used for food and for medicine. And it just has that ancient mm-hmm. allure. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know how it's made. It's just obviously mysterious and fascinating. Yes. So 1492, our man Columbus, he's an Italian guy who convinces the Spanish Ferdinand and Isabella that he thinks he's got a way to the Spice Islands. (laughs) But he doesn't have the GPS. He doesn't actually have (laughs) shit. And they can't, they know that the Spice is in India Mm -hmm. and they know that that is geographically east from them. There's just no way that they can get there. That that is well-tread territory. It's very difficult to get there. It is fiercely protected. There's no way. So Columbus is like, I think I can get there going west. (laughs) They're like, okay, great. And Columbus, of course, quote unquote, discovers the new world, i.e. just accidentally bumps into the Bahamas. Right. And even in his day, like you think Columbus has a bad reputation now. Honestly, his bad reputation now is only really rivaled by the reputation he had in his own lifetime because he was a failure because the whole point the whole point the only thing that would make it financially valuable for spain was for him to come back with spices so columbus (laughs) once he gets to the bahamas and is like hey india hey right no he knows he knows he has to bring back spices he has a hunch this isn't right but he sends all of these merchant seamen to go onto the island and find spice. These guys are shippers. Okay. They they wouldn't know like nobody knows what the fuck this stuff is or Gary, how it grows. Chuck, yeah. Get in the zodiac and go get me some mace. <laughs> That's right. The like the myths, even for the people who thought they knew what they were talking about, they were like cinnamon, it's in birds' nests. And these giant birds are what you gotta do is get big bones so they fly up to the nest with these bones, and then the bones are so heavy it knocks their nests down, and that's how we get cinnamon. We had no fucking so they send these guys into the woods of the Bahamas <laughs> and they're like, Bring back spice, we need to prove to Spain we got spice. So Wait, they, go back one to the bones thing. They're throw they're throw are you saying they're throwing bones at birds' nests? Because I, I I just, I was going to say, yeah, no, I'm going to help. It'll come to me. Nope. I didn't understand no. what you just it said. It would make so much worse. It doesn't, it, this is, I'm going to explain it and it's still not going to make even less sense. So of course they get off the ship, they kayak into the island, they throw bones at birds' nests. They're like, and they give got us your cinnamon bird. Sesame. <laughs> That's how you get paprika. No, they, they would, the myth, the legend, they had no idea, so I'm making it up. So right. this guy was like, where does cinnamon come from? He goes, oh, I'll tell you. There, it's the bird's nests, these giant ass birds that are completely made up, live in these giant ass nests, also completely made up. And the cinnamon is in the bird's nests. And the only way for us to get the cinnamon out is to get those nests down. So we put um, big, heavy bones like of, of the, like the knuckles of an elephant so that the big birds come down. They can't resist these delicious bones and they bring, they fly with the bones up to their nest and eventually their nests get so overladen with bones that the nest falls out and that's how we get the cinnamon. These people were fucking idiots. But isn't it kind of wonderful to think that these native, I like to think that the native people were like, Oh, where do we get our cinnamon? Do yeah. you have a pen? I'm, I would really like you to write this down. It's very elaborate. It's, so stay with me. All of that to say, we didn't, we didn't know. So Columbus says, again, to these sailors, go find some cinnamon, nutmeg, maize. And they were like, okie doke. So they go to shore and they come back with what they find. Right. 
and Columbus is like super. <laughs> he puts in the boat, goes back to Spain, and they for a minute are like, I've never seen this kind of cinnamon before. <laughs> and it, surely he's not lying. <laughs> it tastes a lot like an acorn, but anyway, so they finally like, dude, they dude, Columbus is embarrassed. But people are like, okay. oh, hang on now. But you are saying the world is round. And it is a myth that we didn't know the world was round. Right. We knew the world was round. The problem was we didn't know how big it was. Mm. So Columbus, of course, <laughs> didn't know there was all that stuff <laughs> between Europe and Australia <laughs> and on the other side. So And there's a bit. And there's a handful of things. But it does start to get people like, okay, and Portugal and Spain are right next to each other, of course, and um, very competitive mm -hmm. with each other. And Portugal's like, hang on, though. They're trying to get to India. And so the Pope, to keep the peace, Pope Alexander VI, creates the Treaty of Tordesillas, mm. which is one of the most ambitious treaties in the history of the world. He divides the entire known world between Spain and Portugal wow. and says everything non-Christian discovered West belongs to Spain. Everything on this parallel line found East belongs to Portugal. And Spain and Portugal were like, great. And so the question immediately became, how far east is west? Yes. And how far west is east? Yes. We already know. Okay, you said this side, this but now we're going to race to see who's going to come around so far the other side that Meet we can halfway. negotiate yeah. what is there. And nobody knows for sure. So five years later, 1497, Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese guy, is like, Portugal, we got to go. Am I right? Like, <laughs> we got to jump on like, this, yo. Yeah, Columbus fucked up, but probably not forever. <laughs> so he goes down along the west coast of Africa, down to the Cape of Good Hope. And mm -hmm. he's the first guy, da Gama, to go from the Atlantic Ocean into the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And then he starts to go up the east coast of Africa. And he's like, this is great, except we don't know how we got to get across. We got to get across the Indian Ocean. And we don't know where to cross or what's over there. In Kenya, he's lucky enough to meet an Arabian pilot pilot who's like i'll take you mm -hmm. so vasco da gama with the help of this arabian pilot from kenya sails his boats across the indian ocean and gets to calcut in india <laughs> like Found the it. spot where all of the spices <laughs> are coming from and he's like oh my god and and oh. india's and india's like what the fuck is that? They have no idea. Okay, so now the Portuguese have, have explored a little bit up to this point. No one has ever been out here before. This is right. absolutely 100% new. But they do know that when you get to something absolutely 100% new, you got to be super careful. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so they have this tradition that they've already been using for centuries, which is to bring a character named the Degregado. The Degregado. The Degregado. That is an individual who is either a convicted felon or otherwise expendable person, a converted mm. Jew, somebody <laughs> that they felt they could Canary expect. Canary in a mm -hmm. coal mine. Exactly. And they just send this meat sack to shore first to see if they kill you immediately. <laughs> they just have the one. One. <laughs> Maybe they had more, but they only send them one at a time. <laughs> so they send this poor guy. That's history wow. has history has lost this individual's name. All we know is that the, he was a criminal. Yeah. Sort. They send him to shore. He is surrounded by a crowd of curious people who are like, "What is this? They've never seen anything like this pale faced guy mm -hmm. before." And they were like, "Well, you're not, we've seen Chinese. You're not Chinese. You're not Italian." And they're fascinated. And he's kind of getting fast around this poor guy. I mean, this is the movie. You know. <laughs> What I mean yes, is like this guy. <laughs> Finally, some traders from Tunisia, which is northern Africa, kind of close mm -hmm. to the Mediterranean, are like, that's a European. How and they were here? able to kind of talk to him and they were finally like, buddy, what the devil are you doing here? And he said, We are here in search of Christians and spices. <laughs> Wow. Right? Well, they don't go together, so good luck. <laughs> yeah, I think you meant mayonnaise. <laughs> so Vasco da Gama, he just is like, uh, the Pope said I could have this. And they're like, right. we don't know who the Pope is. Well, and it's you're, like, you're bad. Yeah, I mean, they knew who the Pope was. Right. We had had the Crusades and stuff, but they were like, uh, no. So Vasco da Gama, he heads back. He he kind of gives him the bird. He goes, sails back at the worst possible time, the middle of the monsoons. He his brother dies on the way home. Like it's it's wow. awful, right? But Portugal like gets. The Pumped. Spice Islands. I mean, Spain wow. went west and found Butkus. Portugal goes east and nails it. Wow. So now the question is, again, how far east is west? 
how far west is east and what other stuff are we going to find? And also, like, <laughs> the question was, the Pope said, you know, everything west belongs to Spain, everything east belongs to Portugal. That India belonged to itself was just never a question. Mm. And part of the reason why the Pope felt confident saying that was because Portugal had weapons and a naval fleet and they were able to dominate right. that area militarily. And they did fairly right. quickly. 1511. Another Portuguese expedition is like, we got to lock this shit down. <laughs> like, we got there first. We got to lock this shit down. So they get there and they find the Malaccas, the islands where the spice actually grows. Mm -hmm. Calcutta was just the center of trade. It was mm -hmm. where all the spices ended up. And they actually found some of these tiny islands in the middle of Indonesia where these spices grew. And these spices only grew in the entire world on three and to five of these incredibly tiny islands in Indonesia. So stumbling upon the island where Pretty nutmeg amazing. grew was bigger than finding a, a, I mean, there's at least 10 Egyptian tombs. You know Just what wealth, I mean? wealth, wealth, wealth. Yeah. yeah. And the pilot is like, okay, oh my God, because <laughs> it's small, you know, and he's, they're kind of trying to hide the fact that they found it. They also have a hunch because they had to go pretty far east. Okay. And they're like, I think we're probably over in the Spanish. line. <laughs> right. So they're also trying to keep it quiet because they don't want anyone to know they found it and they don't want anyone to know how far east they had to go to get there. Wow. Dude leaves this guy named Francisco Serrero there. I'm going to say his name again. Francisco Serrero. 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 Um, forgive me. Write me a letter. Tell me how badly Frank I'm doing. Jerry. And he is left. Dude is left there by himself. And they're like, just hang out. Keep an eye on things and just be a delegate while Buddy busts back to Portugal to like let him know what's going on. Right. We found it. Right? <laughs> and no, I, I don't have time to get into the history of this guy. He is an episode, another one, okay. all on his own. First thing he does is he marries an island woman. So smart, right? Just like a lot of future explorers in America. It's like marry a native woman because they are going to teach you. They are going to, you know, right. translate for you. They're going to tell you, like, don't touch that. That guy's bad news. Like, <laughs> yeah. they know what's going on, right? So he marries an island woman and he's going to kind of island jump. He wants to see if he can find the source of some of these other spices, see if maybe they grow elsewhere. While he's island jumping, he gets horribly shipwrecked. Mm. While he's shipwrecked, a group of pirate scavengers come along mm. to try to c collect what they can from this wreckage. Mm -hmm. And when the pirates got close, they attack the pirates and take <laughs> the pirate ship. Then he keeps going. Oh. I know. He keeps going to other islands. He eventually involves himself in this crazy civil war among like some of the tribes of these islands were fighting among themselves perennially. Mm -hmm. He offers the help of like their weapons and their know-how in warfare and becomes best friends with the sultan of one of these small islands. He's his advisor, his best friend, the head of his military. He lives there with him for the rest of his life. Wow. I know. Fascinating in and of itself. But it turns out this guy, Serrero, is also pen pals with a guy named Magellan. <laughs> yeah. Some historical sources say they were cousins. Other, like, they knew each other mm -hmm. somehow. We're not sure why. But he is writing to Magellan like, oh. girl... There is a way around this bitch. And, like, <laughs> and Magellan's like, hot. He's, he's Portuguese. And so he's like, I'll just go to the Portuguese and be like, we got, got, this. We got this. You guys already know we got there. I think we can get around the other side. And Portugal, several problems. One, kind of fucked. They were just like fighting among themselves. Mm -hmm. They were competing with interests among various powers within Portugal. He was having a hard time getting the funding, getting the ships, getting the permission he needed to go. He was so stonewalled. He goes to Spain. He goes, hey, Spain. He just completely sells his services. Wow. It's kind of like imagining people in the space race. I've often mm. had to go to the space race to understand some of the motivations mm -hmm, of these mm -hmm. people. If you're way more interested in getting to Mars than and you are so in doing loyalty, it for yeah. America, right. then you... You go where the getting's good. Yeah. Dos yeah. vidanya, comrade. Let's go <laughs> let's to the go. moon. Let's get up. Right. Let's red planet, yo. So Magellan is like, okay, Spain, let's do it. And Spain's like, this is what we do. <laughs> we, we give people money to go west. You come to the right place. So Magellan leaves from Spain and he goes west just like Columbus did, except he hangs a left, of course, and goes south around the Strait of Magellan, uh, South America, which is so aptly named. He must have been like, like, oh. Oh, I know this place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> My great uncle. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a coincidence. Um, so he goes around, of course, to the Straits of Magellan and then up the uh, west coast of South America and ends up in the Philippines. It takes him a lot longer, yeah. <laughs> obviously, than it took Columbus. And it was a crazy, crazy adventure. I, again, a whole other episode on this. They are stuck. They starve. They get in trade winds. There's a mutiny. So then they get to the Philippines, dude. I don't know if you know. Do you know the history of Magellan? Not you know? all of it, no. So he gets to the Philippines and gets into like some stupid fight and dies. <laughs> 
He man, he like survives all of that stuff. It's like a fight with some native, Indo- like to kind of show off Portuguese European weapon, Machismo. and just yeah, oh. dies. I mean, even his his like beloved biographer is like idiot. Just fuck that up, big <laughs> dummy. Um, but then they have to get home. So I mean, technically, Magellan did not circumnavigate the globe. He fucked off to the Philippines and got into a got bar fight and, and, and died. <laughs> the whole world is competing against these spices, and Spain has finally achieved what like a millennia of European powers have tried to do, which is get in there, right? <laughs> Spain, the king of Spain, basically sells all of the rights that they acquire for next to nothing wow. because he wants to have a really big wedding. <laughs> <laughs> all of his counselors, all of the survivors of the mission were like, buddy, no. And he's like, I know, but if I want the lilies, like the big lilies, <laughs> like I need a gazillion dollars. And I want John Legend to play. <laughs> totally. And they were like, are you nuts? Do you know what scurvy's like? And he's like, sounds gross. But I also want to have like silks. <laughs> anyway, so dude, just ask that I'm up. okay with huge gums. So Portugal is on it. Now, is it worth it? Okay, so Magellan's expedition went out with 270 men, came back with 55, went out with five ships. Only one came back. Wow. It was leaking, <laughs> and it was half full. Magellan himself was dead. When they did the ledgers, and they were like, okay, all those boats, all those guys, all the weapons, all the tools, all the lanterns, all the drums, the cost of the tar, the pitch, the ships themselves, the wages for the men, the back pay for the survivors of the men who died, the pensions, for one ship that had 381 bags of cloves, a little cinnamon, and a little nutmeg. And they made a profit. <laughs> they made a profit. It was a small profit, but they made a profit. That is amazing. Amazing. That is amazing. So at this point, if they hadn't already been real curious about right. what's going on there the dutch and the english were like girl oh, i heard some news <laughs> we have boats i had heard that you guys know where the spices are <laughs> and even more than that the pirates were like it is so hard to go get spices and it is so easy to just find a nice island nearby <laughs> have a couple rum and cokes and when y'all fat ships come low in the water we just Hello. And we can smell you coming. Because <laughs> we're like, downwind of like, your clothes. Yeah. So by 1599, the Dutch arrive and the Portuguese are like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and they, easy come, easy go. Clop, cl- cl- we can hear them coming. Oh, yeah. And by 1605, the Portuguese are gone. They have defeated the Portuguese and sent them out of every port. The English are kind of competing with the Dutch for the minute. And what a bunch of brutal fucking (laughs) fucks the Dutch were. Just thought they were tulip pickers. Dude, they strung up English traders and skinned them over fires. They hung the bodies of of traders that didn't have the correct permits, like, from the galleys in front of their kids. I was a day late. (laughs) Shut up. We don't care. They enslaved all of the native people of the the islands the dutch east india company is like like enron the would, mafia. <laughs> honestly like enron would be like you fuck <laughs> yeah for sure for sure like what's that fucking guy who like raised the price of insulin oh yeah like 300 yeah, percent. yeah even he would be like you guys you guys it down. are overboard i think this is unfair <laughs> come on guys. i think this is unfair to people yeah relax <laughs> um so my friend wayne so we have Gone through this age of all the crazy shit that these people did. But the fact is, Columbus left for a reason. Magellan left for a reason. They already knew about these spices. Even though we didn't know if they came from these birds. (laughs) We had no idea how. But what was the allure, the value, the cost of these spices prior to Columbus leaving Mm -hmm. meant there was this deep old desire Uh for these things, even if it didn't accompany any understanding of them at all. In 1721 BC, Mm. in Syria, they found cloves. We know for a fact those cloves came from India. Fact. How did they get to Syria Mm -hmm. 2,000 years (laughs) One of those big birds. Before, before they can fly. They can carry that up. Stuck in his teeth. <laughs> it's nuts. These guys, I mean, their wingspan alone, it's nuts. Um, so how do we get from this crazy age of discovery to where we are now? And how did we get to that age of discovery from the ancient days? Well, 
I'm going to tell you after the break. I'm going to refill my cup. This I'm going to so snort great. some black pepper. <laughs> I'm going to take off my Hello Kitty headphones. <laughs> oh, no, never do that. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> hey, if you haven't already, you can catch a glimpse of me wearing these oh so very professional Hello Kitty headphones on our Instagram page at Hilf Podcast. And while you're there, you can also see a short video of Wayne and myself in my festive rec room, as well as pictures of most of the people, places, and books that I reference. Now, we are currently cooking up some cool merch, a live taping, and a Patreon account so we can get Mama some of those good headphones. Am I right? <laughs> In the meantime, the best way to support us is still to follow me, follow me, follow me, follow. Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow. Oh. Hopefully, ideally, you start to see yourself in cinnamon. In cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> I am dying to call cinnamon. me that. <laughs> I was like, racist. My little cinnamon Wayne. I am so... You can say your first cinnamon guest. <laughs> you're my... Thank you. You are my... <laughs> you're my first cinnamon guest. You are the spiciest guest that I've had. Cinnamon approved. <laughs> I've, had, I've had a whole sea of Parmesan cheese. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> white cheddar. A lot of white cheddar over here. Lots of mozzarella. I don't know what's a white spice. There is white peppercorns, white pepper, right? actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What else? Onion powder? Mm. That's it. Cocaine. <laughs> cocaine. Just a little sprinkle of cocaine. Just on and my nutmeg. eggs. Just on my eggs. Just in the morning. Hey, get up and go. Um, but of course, okay, so the history yes. of cinnamon um, is old girl. In 1224 BC, the first known consumer of spice was not eating it. It was Ramses II, uh, and it was in his mummification. I have heard about that. Yes. Not only do we know they used cinnamon, among other spices, in the preservation and the mummification the process, mm-hmm. but they also stuck a peppercorn up each one of his nostrils. Pourquoi? We don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. It's sacred. Mm-hmm. And what we know around this time, and even before this time, the spices are always sacred. And as far as we can guess, and because so much of this history prior to the Egyptians is, is a pure guess, mm-hmm. is simply what we still experience, which is the transcendent power of smell. Mm-hmm. Smells make you feel, they make you remember, they make you associate. They are st- Nature is full of smells designed specifically to elicit positive and negative responses. The spices that we have, the clove, the nutmeg, the cinnamon, these are these plants evolving a specific taste and a specific smell to ward off pests. Mm -hmm. This is simply an evolutionary accident that on these five volcanic islands in the beautiful course of biological evolution resulted in something we love. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Human Mm -hmm. beings were really attracted to. It's it's irony. Mm -hmm. They were there to resist pests. They were there to resist eating. And we were so drawn to them in such monumental ways. It shaped our history. We know that there was something about the rarity of these things and their pungency. I've seen throughout the course of this podcast, Wayne is occasionally picking up one of these so containers. And, and every time you do it, your eyes go back into your head. I see it. <laughs> There's a bit of a memory. Over a little sense of memory, a little Udahagen happening in the head there. And the pagans use them as burnt offerings for their gods. Now, the question from a psychological perspective is, does the smell of cinnamon do this to you biologically or it's did gotta, you encounter cinnamon so repeatedly and so early that it's simply a, a, a received association it feels like it has to be somewhere deep in the dna i don't you know more more in nature than nurture almost definitely true um and um and one of the oldest stories oldest myths about cinnamon predates king ramses the second may well have been why the peppercorn was in his nose and the cinnamon was always burned you know the story of the phoenix mm-hmm. the bird that right. goes in flames Sorry. and then re- is reborn from its ashes that is one of the oldest stories ever told it's called better call Saul, and it is an emmy <laughs> darling yeah it is one of the oldest stories ever told we don't know the origins we just know that it is sort of ubiquitously known and that in its earliest tellings and its most persistent tellings the ashes from which the phoenix rises is also infused with cinnamon cinnamon is imperative to the phoenix 
coming reborn again. Wow. We know Alexander the Great, his empire, uh, pop quiz, <laughs> did go all the way from Rome to India. Mm -hmm. He had conquered the known world by the time he was 25, and it included spaces that had spice so he would have had access to some of this stuff and some of those land routes were established and continued under alexander the great in the bible jesus christ's body is wrapped in linens specifically infused with spices specifically cinnamon wow. the romans loved spice too much uh. <laughs> it's a historical question. It was the Romans who started really using spices in wild, crazy ways. And it was for the same reason that Magellan's king and queen were using it. It was a, it was a sign of your wealth and your access to the rare. Um, and even at the time, people in Rome were like, we're going to fall. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think no one's going to know why. And I'm going to know why. And it's because you cunts can't lay off the fucking nutmeg. And they weren't, and they weren't wrong because, because the Rome was gluttonous. We, we know this from its history and its reputation, but this was such a specific problem. They were sending coin, gold and silver coins, their currency, mm -hmm. to the east to buy spices because there was no trade. There was nothing mm -hmm. we could trade in that area. Just gold. They then give us these small quantities of spice that we burn. We burn or we eat and they provide no nutritional value. And people were just like, this is, I'm not, it's not even how I feel about cinnamon, girl. I'm just telling you that we can't sustain <laughs> this. Is sustainable. We are running out of gold and we just keep burning cinnamon. Like, dude. That mine is empty. I know. And all the spice is gone. It doesn't even get you high. Like, we, you know right. what I mean? Cocaine is worth it, though. Cinnamon is like, what? Um, so there were already people in Rome that were like, this is a problem. When they proved. <laughs> to be correct and the goths invade the roman empire mm -hmm. and we have the fall of rome which happens give or take 500 a.d is the fall of rome mm -hmm. christianity has already been well established in rome constantine had adopted christianity we stopped <laughs> killing them for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't easy street from then on. Okay. <laughs> but by the time Rome fell, Christianity had already spread right. to, to a large extent. And one of the things that Christians were like, no more spice girl because it's well, what's separate. Posh spice <laughs> i mean then like baby baby on the weekends but otherwise and they were and they were responding to several things one was the persecution from the romans against the christians sometimes the way that they'd make you prove your allegiance was to burn incense to one of their gods mm -hmm. so they were just like we love the stuff but they were like god right before i got kicked in the ribs all them times <laughs> first thing they made me do was like suck on some like old goddess's titty and like burn some berries like really traumatic so they were just <laughs> i don't want to go back there next year for spring break yeah and then they still killed my kid, like wife it was all it wasn't fun it wasn't fun so they like were very against it it differentiated them from the pagans the romans and the pagans and and islam so you know the monotheistic religions mm -hmm. that arise and, and respond to paganism are the judaism first christianity <laughs> is the official religion of rome and then you get islam and so these are the monotheistic religions that are all decidedly not pagan but share an old testament mm -hmm. that had a lot of spicy in it <laughs> <laughs> right so they had to immediately come to terms with the fact that like in the present uh, which is 800 a.d it's like a political thing that i don't do spice but they had to like come to terms with the fact that their founding documents including christ's burial and all of the way I that do we a little it. myrrh but that's about <laughs> a little, myrrh, it. little frankincense <laughs> but there was like this already this sort of contradiction then which yeah. is like we know it's really sacred like nobody doubts it's really sacred and spices are really important and, and spices are really holy but i don't want to associate myself with it anymore and if i'm going to it's going to be in extraordinary moderation like monks could have it on you know for certain feast days <laughs> they get over that real quick <laughs> <laughs> and like medieval Next. medieval europe is give or take a thousand years it's from about 500 to about 1500 and they at first are like yeah for sure not pagan not roman 
it only takes a few hundred years for them to be like, this shit is good. Uh, <laughs> where I put it on my eggs on like my I did eggs. before. And also, it is still rare and exotic, and now it's even more ancient. And even more, there's even more stories and legends about where it came from. They've established a nobility again mm-hmm. by about 1000 AD. And they like throwing parties and showing you all the cool shit they have. This is what rich people have <laughs> Come always over my loved spice to do. room yeah. and check it out. They would show, you know, these elaborate feasts. And the more spice, the better and excessive spice even more which brings us right back to what was happening at the end of the room mm-hmm. with the spice over spicing you now have poor people who are like we are starting we get a plague every 80 years or so some death wanders through and we are and in between that we just starve to death and they're not allowed to hunt in the king's forest they're not allowed to even have access to the natural resources that are around them mm-hmm. and you have like anything industrious middlemen Who are like, well, uh, I have a hypochondriac, extraordinarily wealthy patron who is just asking me to fix everything. So I'm just going to continue to get all of these extraordinarily expensive spices and, you know, how ancient it is. And I found this book from Pliny the Elder. And so here are some of the uses Okay, I want to get into now some of the ways that these inventive individuals were like, I need a job. (laughs) So I'm going to just start making some shit up. One of the myths is that spices were used in medieval Europe to cover the flavor of rotten meat. It's such a bizarre myth. It is absolutely not true. And it doesn't make any historical or economical (laughs) sense at all. You didn't even have meat if you didn't have money, right? (laughs) Right. So if your meat goes rotten and you're still going to eat it, your spices are so much more expensive than your meat. Right. Yeah, it's like I couldn't afford taking an Uber every day, so I bought a Bentley. Like, <laughs> it was used to freshen wine. Okay. Because wine might Mullet. taste bad, mm-hmm. but it'll still get you drunk. <laughs> it was so difficult to keep wine fresh. These barrels couldn't, you know, that last very long. That doesn't happen in my house. <laughs> no wine. I know. I know. I've heard that too. I just saw this ad for this like elaborate way to keep a bottle of wine fresh. I was like, you idiot, drink it. <laughs> yeah, that's how you keep it fresh. And also, like, vinegar is also good. So your wine turns to vinegar. And you can use the vinegar. And you can use the vinegar. It's not so bad, but definitely <laughs> put on your rotten meat. But on your rotten meat that you shouldn't be eating. And that was the thing. You eat rotten meat, you're just going to shit your guts out. It also doesn't give you nutritional... It doesn't matter. I don't know why these idiots are dummies. Um, I think it's because we like thinking our ancestors were idiots. Because we feel like we have <laughs> evolved, evolved. so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, so, not to freshen our meat, but definitely to freshen our wine. Uh, and then recipes. Of course, you're using it in food. It shows people how rich you are. It makes it taste good. It shows everybody how much stuff you've got medicine was another application of the spices of course and a cook and a a pharmacist and a spicer were all All the the same same person correct and so uh he prescribed cinnamon oil every single morning if you had epilepsy this guy said all you needed to do was get a little gladiator blood and mix it with cinnamon drink that twice a day no more epilepsy. Sounds good for gout, but I don't know about epilepsy. It does. I, I, that's what I thought, Dr. <laughs> Doctor Wilderson. I played one on TV. <laughs> um, jaundice could be cured with pepper, myrrh, and dog excrement. <sighs> <sighs> Apparently, specifically, the white the white part of the dog of excrement. the dog excrement the, like, i want to know the proportions how you mix it up 17. it's on page 17 i have it marked <laughs> um and then there were also the medical quacks that ascribed to if it hurts it's good for you right, right. and this is what inspired the application of ground black pepper to the anus <sighs> pepper hole <laughs> <laughs> the lining of the eyes um, snorted if you were depressed. It was wow. an ailment of the brain. And doctors also wrote among each other, pretty unabashedly, if your patron has money, just keep getting the spices. Just make the more expensive spice and just keep giving it to them. Because they'd be like, yeah, I taste something. I feel something. Wow. And, and it made it really easy. Also, too, when it didn't work, this was how like pernicious our belief in spices were. People were never suspicious of the spice. Just the person who gave it to him. She's a witch. During the plague, there were dead bodies Mm -hmm, stacked mm -hmm. up everywhere. And even the word malaria Mm. means bad air. Mm -hmm. So they would just carry around these spices to to hold under their nose. The fixed vapor rub of the... (laughs) And the ironic part is they thought that all these spices might protect them from the plague. And they would order more and more spices. And it was the rats 
that accompanied these spices that just kept bringing the wow. plague. Like the irony wow. of capitalism never ends. And least we forget, <laughs> my dear friend Wayne, all the things spices do for sex. <gasps> It spices it up, I would imagine. It's the spice of life. It spices it up. She's kind of spicy. That's spicy. You want to get spicy. We always want it. Yeah, we can't help it. We can't help it. No, like, "Mm," it makes me go. "Mm." No, I'm sure that you knew this moment was coming. I will now quote scripture to you. (laughs) Sex scripture. (laughs) You knew. You knew it would happen. (laughs) Proverbs 717. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. Sexy ass Bible. I know that's the, mm, those testaments. <laughs> um, yet another of the many, many references, not just to spice, but to spice as a sex aid in for the Bible. For well, and this is what's so great, Constantine was introduced Christianity, you know, made it the official religion of Rome, wrote a sex book. (laughs) Not kidding. (laughs) Wrote a book called De Coito on sexual intercourse, where he gives suggestions and histories of how to remain fertile, how to avoid impotency, Mm -hmm. um, how to please a woman. These are books for men. Yeah, well, for everybody, but for men. But it was so amazing. And Christians later, of course, were like, hmm... For all the reasons that Christians are generally like, mm. it was in part because even though Constantine was a Christian, he was raised in a very different time when polygamy was right. necessary. The idea of a complete wipeout of your civilization right. was a real specter. We and need, you just more need more, 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 more. Right. Yeah. And so the idea is if you have six wives and you got to have a bunch of kids, then it is a utilitarian thing for you to yeah. know how to keep it up and get it hard in the morning and get some onion powder mm. on that thing and get to work. <laughs> Impotence. For example, Constantine in De Coito writes, cinnamon, spice drink twice a day. I don't doubt for a hot second that there are at least 300 places within the city of Los Angeles <laughs> that will also suggest some sort of cinnamon drink for impotent. Yeah. You need to get hard in the morning. Yeah, morning. Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you got to do it in the morning because your fifth wife gets home at two. I don't know. And you need to have a <laughs> rolling schedule. Mm-hmm. You need your clove steeped milk. That's what you got to drink first thing in the morning. If you're having a flagging sex drive, you need cinnamon and carrots. It's cinnamon and carrots. Cinnamon and carrots. In a carrots. juice way or, or just... I'll consult the manual. Okay. I think... You did go ahead there. What I up? Think you could... I, I mean, you could just like lick a carrot, dip it in some cinnamon. Some, I, don't, some cinnamon. I don't know. Bite Bake carrot. it. I don't know. Whatever See you really like. well. <laughs> I'm sure there's some notes in, in there. Um, and here's what's crazy. Some of this stuff, wow. as, as much as he was basing it on no evidence, a guy named Alan Hirsch who works for the Chicago Smell and Taste Treatment and Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of research your friend Don does. Mm -hmm. Attached a small cuff around the penis of several male volunteers. And I know that scientists, like historians, always have to probably explain to their friends and family what they're working on. But old Alan Hirsch, I'm sure, had a delightful time being like, here's what I'm doing these days, guys. I'm with you. I get these volunteers, and they are very enthusiastic volunteers. Uh, I put a small cuff around their penis. Then I have them smell things. And this cuff determines uh, blood flow and expansion, I suppose. To some extent, it has to measure. I suppose blood flow would automatically be sensing some sort of arousal. Right. And he took measurements. And guess what? Alan Hirsch found. Cinnamon. cinnamon. I was going to say, come on, cinnamon. Cinnamon not only increases the blood flow it increases your sperm count when you ingest it the smell and the taste of cinnamon i'm gonna make all the babies actually and then cinnamon buns (laughs) you got you can't see wayne just sat up straight in his chair you like cinnamons right oh yeah Oh, yeah. Who hasn't been? And I like buns. Who hasn't found themselves pulled by their nostrils from a uh, Past the Spencer's gifts. To, <laughs> you stop in Claire's. You get your ears pierced. You know, Forever 21, you bypass that. And your your eyes are glazed over and you're like, I smell, I smell them. Does this not totally seal the deal on like the way to a man's heart? Absolutely. 
is through his buns. Or the way to his thumb. <laughs> that <was> it. <laughs> you know. Before we had our friend Alan Hirsch and his amazing cuffs. Um, <laughs> did he have research partners or was this something he did in his mom's basement? <laughs> so, I don't know. Episode nine will be Alan Hirsch. I'm going to interview. I'm going to interview Alan. I'm going to be like, you wear the cuff this time, Mr. Hirsch. Um, but like, you know, medical history is fraught and very complicated. Oh. But for centuries, it was based on the idea of the four humors. Very serious medical professionals. Harpo, Groucho. <laughs> Those were the four. Yeah. <laughs> Ringo and John. <laughs> These, and they were great. <laughs> but that would have been as useful, it turns out, than what the four humors actually was. What the four humors suggested was that the human body, from everything from your psychological ills to your physical ills, were based on a balance between wet dry, hot, and cold, and everything, and that you needed to be in perfect balance of hot, dry, wet, cold, and that certain things... Yeah, that makes sense. So, I'll give you an example. You go gray because you're drying up. Kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you were infertile as a woman, you needed to have wet and, and hot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you were depressed, you were too wet. <laughs> And you needed to be dried up. So anything that they needed to adjust in a human body was sort of assumed on these four humors. Wow. And it took hundreds of years for us to be like, it bugs. <laughs> it bugs the bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also why we call it a cold. Finally, we get to the point we started at. The 1600s, the age of discovery. At this point now... Christopher Columbus come and gone, the Magellan, we've established the Portuguese and then the Dutch. And now the Dutch are in firm control of all of these spice islands and we have a whole new normal. And as I mentioned before, we start to get reappearances of the same old fights that we had in ancient Rome, which is this is a waste of resources. We have these hungry people who keep dying of the plague and you all are spending my rent to make your eggs <laughs> impressive to someone. We, we spend another 150, 160 years that it's just Dutch East India Company and this status quo. Yeah. In 1755, this very interesting cat, he's a one-armed Frenchman named Peter Poivre, which I think means uh, poor. Pepper. Peter, Pi- Peter Poivre picked a pack of yeah. pickled peppers. Oh, he arrives in the Malaccas. And at this point, Everybody hates the Dutch. Fuck your clogs. <laughs> Fuck your chips. Take that windmill and everybody hates the Dutch. The native people hate the Dutch. Everybody who's ever traded there in the past, they're the worst. And they and they are super paranoid the way people who are the worst get. Yet, yeah. Because they know how shitty they are. I mean, oh, I think it's everybody that hates us. Oh, and like abominable stories. Yeah. You can read about in the book. There's one the one of the last governors of of one of the Dutch East India Company's ports. Mm-hmm. He's bedridden and he insists on personally smashing out the teeth of a guy who had started a small rebellion on the island. He just wanted him to bring him up to his room so that he could personally smash. I mean, it's just ridiculous wow. cruelty and gratuitous awfulness that yeah. comes with a crazy imbalance, monopolies like these things do. So uh, still at this time, 1755, clove and nutmeg are only and exclusively found on these tiny, tiny islands in Indonesia. Cinnamon and cassia grow in some places in China, but these two, nutmegs and clove, like Mm -hmm. those are the super, super protected ones. They are so fiercely protective that anytime they even hear a rumor of it growing somewhere else, they torch the island to the ground. (sighs) You know, and to keep the prices high... They burn bonfires of cinnamon. So they're also just exploiting their customers openly and constantly. (laughs) Right. So old Peter, one-armed Peter, has a single boat and a plan. (laughs) He's like, I'm going to steal this shit. I'm just going to steal it and replant it. I think I can. That's it. That's the plan. I'm going to steal some baby plants of these cloves and nutmegs, and I'm going to take it all out from under them. People had had this idea before and tried it before, but it had never quite worked, sometimes because of scale. <laughs> and one-armed <laughs> Peter's like, well, I'm just going to do it. And it is not hard at this particular time to ha- find people who want to help him. He speaks with some of the islanders, some of the other traders, some of the native people, and they finally, after after weeks of negotiation and kind of listening to him and testing him out, making sure they're not being set up, because God knows, they just get their teeth knocked in for fun. You have to tell me if you're a cop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They bring him a boatload of seedlings, and Peter takes them back to France, plants them in Versailles, and guess what year they finally start to grow? 
1776. <laughs> the stolen spice. The poor guy's like, wow. we did it. Now <laughs> we finally own the clothes. Nobody cares about clothes. Nobody cares about fucking clothes. What's, where is everybody going? <laughs> I was talking. <laughs> He's, and he can't even clap. The it's, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> he can't. This, this sound of a revolution is one hand clapping. <laughs> I know. He just all he could do was like gesture wildly for everyone to come back. It's too late, Peter. Hmm. Depending on what century you're looking at. Columbus just finally got on top, <laughs> right? The stuff that Columbus did find in the New World is even more intriguing than spice. It took 284 years for us to realize the gold, the silver, the agriculture, the settlement, the colonies, the continuing to trade that spurs even more egregious mm -hmm. trades of the slave trades from Western Africa. And then the continuing fighting between all of these European powers, all of the Dutch, <laughs> the Dutch were like, we really over indexed on the nutmeg, <laughs> but remember we were the most powerful Fox in the world. It was just for a while. And then cinnamon in 1795. So only about 25 years mm -hmm. later, um, the Royal Navy transplants a ton of cinnamon and breaks the cinnamon monopoly. And so now here you and I sit, Wayne, it's 2022 <laughs> and we moved on from the spices to opium, mm -hmm. laudanum, <laughs> which is, includes opium, <laughs> cocaine, mm -hmm. sugar, caffeine. So... On the one hand, you think, obviously, we as a species, as a, as a humanity, we have moved past spices. However, hmm. <laughs> Obsession by Calvin Klein includes cinnamon and nutmeg in its <sighs> recipe. The Coca-Cola <laughs> recipe includes cinnamon and nutmeg. <sighs> and so if you really want to talk about what's dominating the world it snuck around, but it's like still there, <laughs> you know, it's still dominating us. That's um, pretty cool. That, my friend Wayne, is the hilth of <laughs> cinnamon. I'm, I, are you, are you as I, hungry as you are aroused? I'm very aroused. I'm going to get this cuff off soon. <laughs> Eat something it's to make science. all of the babies. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to have something with cinnamon. In it tonight. What about like mulled tonight. wine would be kind of a... Yeah, I mean, but what do you just microwave it and put a stick of cinnamon in? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, microwave. I believe, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it for exactly this reason. I'm going to include a recipe for mulled wine. It's baking powder, right? It... It's, yeah, cocaine. <laughs> It's in baking soda and cinnamon up sticks. your nose and then you lay on your back and you have somebody open a box of wine. Um, no, generally the way I have made mulled wine in the past is you get yourself a small crock pot and crock pot. you uh, fill it with red wine. I think mm -hmm. ideally. And then some folks will put the cinnamon sticks and the cloves and stuff mm -hmm. in there and let it kind of cook. And mm -hmm. then you siphon that off. You screw right. everything. Or I, people, if they have crushed spices, will put it in tea bags and just drop them tea bags there in the wine. Right, right, right. And then it's warm and it's spicy. I have red wine, crock pot, cinnamon, and other spices. And then what you do is you lay on a sheepskin rug <laughs> in front of a fire <laughs> and you eat turkey off of a drumstick and you when you're done with your dishes you just throw them on the ground because who gives a fuck yeah that's it this was an incredible fucking of history i knew i would like to fuck this history i'm so glad i didn't know i'd liked it this much i didn't know i would either i mean honestly when you said cinnamon i was excited because it was just like what? Something I hadn't thought of, you know. <laughs> and the reason why I love doing this podcast and the reason is the same reason I love history in general. Yeah. Because I've never, ever found a subject that someone else is passionate about that I have not found. It's going to be passion. hard to dead end on this one, right? It, I think so. Yeah. I really don't look forward <laughs> to the day that I have to look at some guest and be like, Burp. Be like, I fucked James K. Polk. <laughs> 
And I just don't know what to do with this. It's the worst. I can't, I really can't imagine. I, it might be a good challenge. Maybe you, maybe one of our listeners can suggest something so awful. Try to stump the history fucker. Stump the fucker. <laughs> well, listen, Wayne, I am honored that you came. I'm honored that you asked me to come. This uh, was absolutely incredible. Come back again. I don't mind if I do. I'm going to think of something. Well, it doesn't really matter if I think of something really good or not. It's going to be good. Well, I adore you. I thank you. You You are welcome back any time. Thank you so much. This was incredible. Wow, friends, what a journey we've been on together. From ancient Rome to Calvin Klein, hot damn. Uh, a special thanks, once again, to Wayne Wilderson. If if you get lonely for him, uh, you know, just turn on your TV. Chances are he's on it. <laughs> now, our next episode is going to take us out to sea yet again, but this time among some of the most fuckable rogues in history the real pirates. I am joined by voice actress and TikTok star Shelby Young. She voices many beloved characters, including Princess Leia for Disney's Star Wars Forces of Destiny, and as pertains more to my house, Raina on Nickelodeon's Baby Shark's Big Show. (laughs) I know. So join us for The Pirates, where I'll cover the most incredible events, dangerous duels, and colorful characters ever to grace the seven seas. It'll swash your buckle, girl, and you don't want to miss it. In the meantime, this is Dawn Brody reminding you that history's a party and everybody's coming. Fuck.